I'd like to begin this afternoon unconventionally by honoring the memory of Rabbi Sanger. It has been a great privilege to occupy the office of rabbi and to sit each day beside his certificates of ordination from Breslau. Less than two months ago, Brian, who recited the Haftarah this morning, sent me a digital copy of his bar mitzvah service from 1961. And apart from the fun that I had listening to Brian as a 13-year-old, I was blown away by the commanding voice and presence of Rabbi Sanger, Allah HaShalom. Can I see a show of hands who in the congregation today had a bar or bat mitzvah with Rabbi Sanger? How many of you stood beneath the chuppah with Rabbi Sanger? Thank you. Some time ago, one of my dearest friends gave to our family a silver shekel weighing just 14 grams a shekel that circulated in Judea in the years just prior to the destruction of the Second Temple. One face bears the image of an eagle, while on the other face is the image of a Phoenician god. It's at this point where Rabbi Levi turns to Robin and says, I think I have that coin. <laughs> My coin is more than just a precious Jewish artifact to me. It is a magnet that attaches me to my land and my people and my faith and to the remarkable history of the third Jewish commonwealth, the state of Israel. A magnet, this, with attractive powers, despite living some 2,000 years following its circulation and 13,707 kilometers precisely from Jerusalem. Yet for many, attachment to our ancestral homeland symbolized by this coin has grown faint. And we've grown tired Tired of hearing about political divisions, religious extremism, the disenfranchisement of reformed Jews, the harassment of women of the wall, and threats to democracy. We are tired of the endless conflict with the Palestinians, disappointed in Israel's leaders and in their seeming inability to come to a comprehensive peace with their neighbors. We prefer the fairy tale of Israel. Once upon a time, there lived a girl named Israel. Her life was sad. She had no independence. One day, a knight in shining armor, Herzl by name, joined by his army, the Zionists, came to save Israel. From that day on, Israel became the most popular girl in all the land. Everybody loved her. Israel and all her friends lived happily ever after the end. But Israel is not a fairy tale. She is a modern, complicated nation state, more like a troublesome teen than an adorable, fawning toddler. Israel, 
a 75-year-old teenager. And like a teenager, Israel is riven with contradictions, religious and secular, left and right, ancient and modern, Hebrew and Arabic, Muslim and Jews. Noah Tishby, who visited Melbourne just a few weeks ago, put it quite well in her 2021 book entitled Israel, A Simple Guide to the Most Misunderstood Country on Earth, writing, Zionism is a verb, something that is still in action. It is, after all, a movement, and as such, always on the go. Much like the Jewish tradition that answers a question with a question, Zionism is still here to learn, to debate with itself, and to transform. In short, Israel is hard work. For most of her existence, we, living Chutz Aretz outside of the land of Israel, have agreed to do our share of the work, planting trees in Israel through the JNF, buying Israeli bonds, donating generously to the UIA, attending rallies and celebrations, making periodic visits whenever possible, sending our children to Netzer camp, and to programs in Israel. Many of us, I would imagine, have stood up and spoken out on behalf of Israel in school, on campus, or in the workplace. Now, however, I believe that our passions may have cooled to Israel and Israel is out of fashion for many, especially our children and grandchildren. But nothing has cooled so far as our Israeli cousins are concerned. They are on the march. Their passions are aroused. The stakes are high, and Israelis have recommitted to their part of the work. They are like the popular Doobie Brothers song, taking it to the streets. Tens of thousands of protesters and counter-protesters every week for much of this past year, rallying and prosecuting their case for the future of Israel. These indefatigable marchers are the spiritual descendants of Israel's Chalutzim, her pioneers, her returnees and defenders, those who, in Ben-Gurion's words, made deserts bloom, revived the Hebrew language, built villages and towns, and created thriving communities. And why do they march? I surmise that they do so for numerous reasons, some to fight and others to defend the proposed judicial overhaul about which we've heard so much. But it's so much more than that. Some march because it is their one and only home, Ein Brera, because they feel they have no other choice. They march because they want to ensure so far as possible that their children and grandchildren will grow up in a democratic Israel inspired by Jewish law, but not subject to coercion under it. And they march to honor the sacrifices made by their parents and grandparents who came from throughout the world seeking refuge and freedom, having so little, making do, but giving all. And they march out of loyalty, what is referred to in Hebrew as ne'emanut. In 2022, 
Dr. Mijal Bitten, a research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America, gave in Jerusalem a seminal address on ne'emanut, loyalty, drawing liberally on the work of Israeli philosopher Meir Buzaglo. She began to, by describing how people honor their family's traditions and values, not because they have freely chosen them out of the entire marketplace of ideas, nor because they are rationally convinced that they are objectively the best ideas, but rather out of ne'emanut, loyalty to their parents, loyalty to those who've come before. And because we have a special relationship with those who come before us, because we're part of a long chain, we decide to be loyal. Buzaglo and Bitten argue that we show Ne'emanut to Israel not necessarily because we believe just as they do or act the way they do, and not out of blind faith or constant agreement. We are loyal to Israel out of respect for an ethical commitment. Sometimes we argue with them, sometimes we criticize, criticize them, sometimes we are disappointed, but we are pledged to care for Israel, to show up for Israel and for those there in need, to want what is best for Israel and rejoice in their celebrations and mourn their sorrows. Dr. Bitten reminds us of how Jews have, for as long as can be remembered, ended our Siddharim and the Ni'ila service of Yom Kippur with the same words, L'shana haba'a Rushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. She posits that the entire Jewish people are an extended family, as the Talmud teaches, called Yisrael Arevin Zebazen. All Jews are intertwined with each other. These connections, in her words, undergird her ne'emanut, her loyalty to Israel, and should, I will suggest to you today, be the foundation of ours as well. This is a very helpful characterization of the historical connection with Israel that we must not disregard. Our connection to Israel, now as ever, is irrevocable. And we mustn't put it aside out of fatigue or because of our disagreements with the government of the day it is an ethical commitment. The same commitment that was established with the Avot of Israel, our ancestors, the same one that was established at Sinai and passed down faithfully to us. It is a commitment founded on thousands of years of Torah, of shared values, forged in persecution, and paid in blood again and again by our people. How can we drop the ball? We cannot nor dare not forsake Israel or become indifferent to Israel. We are family and families are expected to be loyal to one another even when we disagree. As Mario Puzo puts it in The Godfather, a movies, movies which Jocelyn only permits me to watch when she's not around. <laughs> the strength of a family, the strength of an army, lies in its loyalty to each other. Time and again, 
our cousins in Israel have shown extraordinary loyalty to the Jewish state and to one another. During the Arab riots of the 20s and 30s, when engaged in clandestine efforts to bring Jewish refugees from Europe, during the War of Independence in 1948 and 1949, during the Suez Crisis in 56, in Lebanon, in Sinai, in Gaza, the Golan, and on the streets of Israel, during two bloody intifadas and years of sustained terror. Today, however, I would like to draw your attention to one specific example of loyalty that took place 50 years ago this day. And for you to join me in honoring the memory of the nearly 3,000 soldiers and sailors and airmen who died in defense of the Jewish state during the Yom Kippur War. The Jewish Telegraphic Agency in November of 1973 described those who perished in defense of the state in the following way. Kibbutzniks and city dwellers, new immigrants and old established families, Westerners and Jews in the traditional dress of their Oriental countries of origins, civilians and men and women in the khaki uniforms of the armed services, each of whom gave the full measure of their devotion and sacrifice. The Yom Kippur War, which is the subject, I understand, of a newly released movie starring Helen Mirren on the subject of Golda Meir, has in fact been told through the voices of many survivors through a number of years. Like Yitzchak Brook, a physician who described his service during the Yom Kippur War in his 2011 book called The Sands of Time. The then young physician was preparing to observe Yom Kippur when he was called away from his home and his family to go directly to the front lines. He described the scene. The fighting was fierce and victory came only at a steep price. I watched them as they overcame the many difficulties and performed their mission despite constant danger, as they heroically conquered their fears and anxieties. Many of them paid the ultimate price doing just that. A heartwarming story, also from this period, reflects something of the deep neshama, the soul and spirit of Israel that knits us together. It's the story of a single soldier, a lone soldier named Jonathan Davis from the US. He wrote many years later that at the war's end, when I returned to my tiny apartment in Jerusalem's Kiryat Yovel neighborhood, I found myself somewhat aloof from the Georgian Jews living in the building. I had no connection with them. Upon returning to my apartment, I was miffed to find that my mailbox had been painted bright red and that the paint had glued the letters together. Now, I thought very highly of myself at that time, he wryly recalls. I was a lone soldier, after all, from California, and understood more and thought I was better than the others in a rather egocentric way. Davis was angered at the apparent vandalization of his mailbox and its contents. So he confronted one of the elders and complained about their seeming disregard for him given that he had just returned from fighting in Egypt. The elder looked at Davis and replied, we knew that you were the only one in this building who went to war. 
and we painted your mailbox red so that the angel of death would skip over your threshold and spare you. Davis was touched by his response and realized that the Jews in his building truly cared and loved him, and together they shared a common destiny. Almost 50 years after the war, then Prime Minister Yair Lapid honored those who fought and those who died by drawing a direct line between the Yom Kippur War and the condition of Israel today. He said, of concern to me is how the unity of 1973 has given way to division. If we allow ourselves to be divided in times of relative quiet, we will not know how to stand together in times of war. Our enemies need to know that Israeli society is stronger than any disagreement, that Israel's power is the power of unity, that in life or in death, nobody must succeed in dividing us. An accomplished rhetorician, Lapid, he concluded, just as I soon will, saying, out of the great pain of our fallen soldiers, we must flourish as one country. The fallen of the Yom Kippur War did not fall so that Israel's society would break apart from within. The best way to remember them is to remember the objective for which they sacrificed their lives. A strong, democratic Israel that leaves nobody behind. If we know how to die for one another, we should also know how to live for one another. We are not fighters, as our Israeli cousins are and must be. But we have a stake in Israel's future and an interest in her domestic tranquility. We are blessed in this magnificent country. We are not required to give the full measure of our loyalty, as did those who have fought time and time again and died for Israel's freedom. But we can and must do that which is within our power. We can learn about Israel in 5784. Learn much more than we ever knew before. We can invest in Israel and give to our UIA progressive appeal. We can support those who in Israel most closely support our values and share them. And if you have not already done so, visit Israel, learn her story, and share that story with anyone who will listen, but most especially with your children and your grandchildren. It is a story we should be proud to embrace. Israel has brought about the regeneration of our Jewish people in our lifetime. And if only for that reason, is deserving of our ne'emanut, our loyalty. Israel has absorbed millions of immigrants, built a high-tech economic giant, created a new agricultural infrastructure of trees and reservoirs and roads, turned the desert green, all with one hand tied behind their back. Though despised by the world, though misjudged by the world, and attacked over and over and over again by its neighbors. Israel has never been perfect. It is easier to aspire to a purity of arms than to demonstrate that purity in battle 
or when exercising authority over those who do not wish it. It is simpler to quote from the prophets than to live by the teachings of the prophets. Israel makes mistakes and will continue to do so. But be very careful. It isn't reason enough for us to turn away from our Israeli family with a yawn. As for me, I am a Chovev Sion, a lover of Israel. And I cannot wait to get on board that plane to Tel Aviv on October the 29th, together with members of our congregation. There are spaces still available. You should talk to me in the new week. Some people say to me, however, Rabbi, is this a good time to go to Israel? For me, it's always a good time to go to Israel if to stand shoulder to shoulder with the co-authors of our redemption and to witness the daily renewal of a culture and a language, the rebuilding of a land, just as the prophet Amos saw it coming. It says, Vishavati et Shavut Ami Israel, I will restore my people Israel, and they shall rebuild ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall build and plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall till gardens and eat their fruits. Velo ye not to shu old me alad matama shonatati lahem, and I will plant them upon their soil never more to be uprooted from the soil that I have given them. Gemar Chatimah Tovah.